Dr. Paul D. Abramson graduated from Tulane Medical School in 1929. If he were still alive, he'd be about 118 years old. So he's recent history and reality compared to some of the people that uh, are icons in the system of care at the Mayo Clinic. But nonetheless, next to Dr. John McDonald, this was an iconic figure in our history. Dr. Abramson, after <coughs> graduating, did some work in some kind of surgical training. But back in the day, there was very unstructured surgical training. And so none of us know really how long he, uh, he tried to learn how to operate before he started doing it. He came here, though. His first paper out of the charity hospital system in Shreveport was written in 1932. And the topic had to do with the use of insulin in surgical patients. He worked here his entire career as a surgeon in the charity hospital system. He became iconic largely because I think he was the chief of surgery at the time that the Confederate Memorial <laughs> Medical Center was built here on this property. The charity hospital system uh, had its roots from way back in the 1800s, 1878, and it moved a couple of times because it wasn't big enough and another time because it burned down. But it moved here on this site and opened on this site in 1953, in the middle of the period of time when Dr. Abramson was chief of surgery. This is a 23-acre site, and interestingly, we still work out of the same hospital, though it's had some additions and new wings and so forth. And Dr. Abramson, though, uh, was uh, the person of note in that era. At first, uh, there was a award named after Dr. Abramson. It was the Intern of the Year Award. And the Intern of the Year Award was presented to the global intern back in the days when we had rotating internships. You weren't a PGY1 in surgery or medicine or urology. You just were an intern that rotated through all services covering the whole hospital. And back in the day, there were anywhere between 20 and 40 interns, depending on how many you could recruit to come here. And the award was for the intern of the year. And that award went away with uh, services when there was no longer a global internship. And subsequent to that, though, because of his iconic status, it was decided to name a lectureship after Dr. Abramson. And the first Abramson lecturer was Dr. Dean Warren, uh, a notable figure at Emory University, notable for primarily for his work with the distal splenorenal shunt for portal hypertension. And he was the very first lecturer, the very first uh, person who filled the Abramson Professorship. And now, today, we have a new uh, professor that's going to fill that role. Dr. Abramson kind of matured over time, got a little gray. And now we have somebody trying to mature, too. He's still a child to most of us. Only 55, I think you told me, David. Uh, but David, I think you've noticed from his uh, behavior here with us, I mean, after all, he's from the Mayo Clinic. He's iconic himself already. And the truth is, he presents a series of mistakes he's made yesterday. And today, he tells Andrew that Andrew can do things he can't. He hadn't done an endoscopic component separation. He didn't have to tell Andrew that. He could have acted like he'd already done 100,000 of those. So uh, David is an example for us to walk humbly but accomplish a lot. And he has written 231 papers as of four months ago, and that's probably maybe 331 now. I think daily you have to check. He's uh, published two books, uh, chapters, double-digit chapters. He's written a lot first about things like hernias, gallbladders, adrenals, thyroids. And then he became kind of interested in education. I'm not sure if his success in education bred his interest or his interest bred his success, but David Farley, that you know now, has won 13 annual teaching awards at the Mayo Clinic in the Department of Surgery. And so this probably came because he was interested in education, and he uh, began to write, instead of about thyroids and adrenals, he began to write about uh, research in the education of surgeons. 
And then that led to William policymaking roles. He is very active at multiple committee levels with the consortium of the uh, academic institutions that represent the American College of Surgeons. He's well known to all of the people at the college in the education arena and is into policy making now. And so education is his thing and his topic today is about education, I think. <coughs> David, let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you very much. It's a real honor to be here. Um, people from the Mayo Clinic, they're, they're bright and they're talented, but they're no better than anybody else. And I love working with young people that are going to make me a old has-been. And yep, I'll never remember him because you're doing such great things. I need to boot up my talk here for a second. Hopefully I can find it for you. But what I'd like to talk about today is surgical education. And my title is Striving for Utopia, and it's an uphill battle. And I'm looking for better surgical education because I want people to be better than I am. And uh, I think that's definitely possible. But the reality is right now, for those of us that are old enough, I feel like it is a perfect storm for educational problems. Uh, maybe not as bad as the boat is, but it's tough to play Alabama every year. It's not a piece of cake. Having said that, this state has done better than virtually any other team to play against Alabama. But if we're not playing Alabama, we're playing education, the staff surgeons have to generate revenue. They're relative value units. They don't have time to teach. Trainees need autonomy. This program sounds like it's got a lot of autonomy, which is fantastic. But a lot of programs around the country don't have much autonomy for their residents. They don't know to make that decision. Somebody's already held it for them or opened up the graspers and buzz between. They haven't had that opportunity to learn. The duty hours is a factor. There's less time in the hospital. Um, more repetitions is a good thing. So many of our patients now are outpatients. Here to four, 30, 40, 50 years ago, everybody was an inpatient. Services would have 50, 60, 70, 80 people on them. You got a chance to interact with patients. There was more opportunity. There was a lot of busy work, and I think it's better now, the care that we render. But there's less time to interact and find out how to deal with patients. People talk about generations. Oh, these people right here, the millennials, they're so tough to deal with. That hasn't been my experience at all. They're bright. They're talented. They've learned in a different way. They've been biased, just like me as a baby boomer, have been biased in a certain way. And I'll touch on that a bit. The medical schools that we have here, Great schools, but there's more and more knowledge to be learned. There's twice as much to learn as when I was in medical school in the 80s. How do you do that? How do you jam that in? It used to be that surgery in a third year was at least three-month rotation. Peds was three months. Medicine was three months. ob -GYN was three months. At the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, it's four weeks of surgery. Four weeks. That's not enough time for people to really develop into better learners before they come into their surgical residency. And money's always a problem. At Mayo, we think of our practice as a big tricycle, one of those old-fashioned ones. The clinical practice, that generates all the money, and all the money goes there. Then the research wheel is a little smaller, and there's a tiny little wheel for education. I'd like to talk to you about a little bit of things that we're doing at the Mayo Clinic, and what I'm doing in particular, because not everybody agrees with me at Mayo. And I'd like to make a plea that this is not utopia. This is not panacea. I got all sorts of mistakes. I'm trying hard to create a utopian world that I can get trainees to basically, before they start with me, and fix a hernia, or take out a thyroid gland, or fix an adrenal gland, that they know the anatomy inside and out before they start in the operating room. I'd like them to be able to tell me the steps of an operation before we do the operation. I'd like them to know how to take care of a post-operative patient that had a pheo removed and gets hypotensive very common. They need to know how to do that. They need to know the logistics, the quirks of Dr. Farley, what pearls, what pimp questions. I want them to know all of this before they start with me. Because if you know all that before you start with Dr. Griffin, or Dr. Spiller, or Dr. Jones, or Dr. Smith, it's going to be that much bigger of a better of experience. They're going to know nuances. You're going to be able to teach and train better. So that's the preface to my talk today, is this is what I want. I want people to be brighter and more talented so that everybody in the front row, I want them to have everything these 
poor people here have, short of the clinical experience that you folks have garnered with thousands of hours? And is that possible? So, my guiding principle in this whole thing is based on a German PhD, a Swede who's now at Florida State, and some psychology books that I read. And it all boils down simplistically to education boils down to repetition. Some way or another, you've got to do things over and over again. Maybe different ways, but you've got to have repetitions to be good. So Ebbinghaus, you may never have heard of him. He's long ago dead, but in the late 1880s, he basically said, Dr. Farley gives a reasonable talk here this morning. You come back 20 minutes later and ask the people, hey, what did he say? They'll retain about 40% of what I said. If you wait a day, they'll forget 70%. They'll forget 80%. At 30 days, it's lucky that you know 10%, meaning this is the forgetting curve. 90% of what I'm going to say here, you will forget. And I feel bad about that. Quite honestly, I should walk out of here. I shouldn't be paid for anything that I'm doing. But you're going to forget what I'm going to say here. Unless I can scare the crap out of you, or do something novel, or repeat things multiple times. So Ebbinghaus developed this forgetting curve. You give somebody a repetition. How do you tie a knot? What's the anatomy of the adrenal gland? Whatever the thing is, they're going to forget that. Retention is going to be less than 20%. You give them another repetition, they'll retain a little bit more. And so it goes. Most normal human beings, of course, everybody here is above average. That's what you folks are. You have to be above average, because we all are. If you give seven repetitions on average, you can sometimes get people to retain 90% of what you're talking about. And those repetitions can't just happen all today. They need to be spaced out over time to allow your long-term memory to work. Anders Ericsson will tell us about repetition. He's the guy that gets credit for 10,000 hours. Malcolm Gladwell made all the money with his books, but this is the guy that's done all the work. We brought him to the Mayo Clinic. It's a fantastic discussion, and he talks about three things, being master surgeons. I don't know if the four of you are master surgeons, but you're working your way toward it. You have to have deliberate practice, which involves repetition, drills with a mentor, and it's not always fun. Shooting free throws day after day, playing the cello, whatever it is, to be good at something, you need deliberate practice. You need to be somebody giving you feedback and coaching you through this. And it's not always fun. You need to have feedback. Immediate, delayed, it needs to be voluminous, it needs to be constructed. Let me show you about this. You didn't do that right, you need to do it better over here. That's right, not right. You have to have that. And the last of the three things, to be a master surgeon, if that's what we're going to try to do, or a cardiologist, or whatever we're going to be, you need to have drive. And that's intestinal fortitude, and you folks have had it. You finish five years of general surgery training, what I call being a hungry dog. You go out and find food. You're never going to give up. And so this is what Erickson's teaching us about education. I had my hip replaced last summer, and I was out of commission for a month, and I read a bunch of books. These three books were not bad. The one in the middle was the best one that I read. I read about 12 books on education, so now I'm potentially dangerous as an educator. Nobody taught me how to be a teacher, but these books would suggest what I know to be true that my mom and dad taught me as both educators. You need to be engaging. Hopefully this talk this morning will engage you. You need to have repetition. Repetition. Multiple repetition. And that repetition can't be three things in a row. It's got to be practice and not tying today, tomorrow, next week, a month from now, three months from now, a year from now. And then maybe every other year or something if you've got it down. You need to have quizzes. You need to be tested on them. Nobody likes to be tested. But this quizzes, the absite thing, putting the seven quizzes, if you're serious about do, making a better product for your scores, you need more quizzes. You need to commit to it. You can't just sort of read something, oh, I know that. No, you need to answer the quiz and find out that you don't. The ultimate thing, what I'm looking for here today, is to give a presentation. At the end, I'm looking for a discussion, because retention will be longer if you have a discussion. And lastly, my older staff that are in the audience, don't feel bad about giving negative feedback. Negative feedback is retained three, four times better than positive feedback. Way to go, Patrick. Way to go, Andrew. Nice job. Even though it sucked, it would be better off <laughs> if Dr. Griffin said to David, hey, that's a lethal move. You can't do that. You've got to put the clamp this way. Let me show you why. That is going to be retained longer. You guys are all phenomenal. So again, I'm picking on you here because you're the only people I know the names to. So I feel like I can do that. 
So in summation, my preamble to my talk, you've got to have frequent assessment, you've got to have engaging resources, you've got to have memory and skill acquisition, give people an opportunity to retain that knowledge, and then you've got to give them a lot of feedback. And that will create better education. So here's what we're doing at the Mayo Clinic, and we've done this for a better part of my career, and I've spent a lot of time and a lot of hours. So unlike the team here, we do the boot camp, and then we put them in what we call the Surgical Olympics. Interns get a little shock value. Welcome to the Mayo Clinic. We're going to show you how bad you are. We have a lot of objective studies, and we try to identify deficiencies off the get-go. It started 10 years ago. We had a sim center built back then. It's a nice sim center, but it doesn't have to be done in a sim center. It would be done in this room and a couple other offices. We hold a Summer Olympics in July, and in Rochester, we're good at the Winter Olympics. We usually have snow and whatnot. There are nine 15-minute stations. We do 36 trainees. We can basically finish in five hours or less and tell you the 36 interns who's the best and who's the worst. There's no question. And it's interesting we can find out that that tends to hold over time for five years. Interesting stuff that we have not yet published. This is the floor plan to our simulation center. We have 16 different rooms that we use. We don't need to use that many. One of the stations is a simple written test, a bunch of different things that I ask. What's the anatomy of the adrenal gland? What is the tubercle of Zucker candle? Who knows what that is? A variety of different things. Much of what I do is low cost. I'm not into the big expense because nobody's given me a bunch of money. This is a cricothyrotomy model. Hopefully, if my videos work later, I'll show you how to make one. We evaluate a septic patient. just happens to be a mannequin. The stations in 2006 look something like this. We tie knots. We made them dictate a lymph node biopsy. We evaluate a septic patient. We ask them to put a needle in the right internal jugular vein on a mannequin. We ask them about blood gases, read a chest x-ray, do a crite in 45 seconds or less. We ask them to do the FLS peg transfer like they're going to have to do. You folks have already done that to sit for your boards. We had a little wee camera game. We did an imaging study and a written test. Lots of different things. It's video recorded. It's analyzed. It's every one of these stations has objective criteria. My eighth grade sons have been my scores for some of this stuff. They can do it. It's not hard. Ten years later, you can get a sense that not much has really changed. It's still sort of the same stuff. I got rid of the wee imaging game and did something else. This is our chest tube or our uh, azagus vein um, station here depicted. Most of my stuff doesn't cost any money. It's not difficult to do, and it's not something that everybody's readily comfortable with. But I like to pimp. I like to ask questions. I like to learn. And I ask. Interns come in. Mayo has a funny way of putting our blood gases. The numbers are probably different than the way you have them. But I ask them, what do each of those five numbers stand for in patient A? And then we're done with that. I said, what's going on with patient A? And can they tell me uh, that looks like somebody on supplemental O2, but otherwise looks good. And on the bottom, that looks like metabolic acidosis, and I'm not sure exactly what the problem is, but that person's in trouble. We asked them to look at simple things, chest x-rays, write down their answers. And in July, 90% of people will fail the cricothyrotomy station. They cannot safely put in a crike in 45 seconds. They cannot find the right internal jugular vein, and they can't put in a chest tube safely. Here depicted one of our young trainees putting the chest tube in backwards with the spear and no tunneling. That was a new technique for me. This is acting, but this is what we've seen. I hope I don't see this here in LSU. And here comes my intern, incision, no tunneling whatsoever. Put the spear in, what the heck, it'll be good enough. We'd like this not to be our behavior, if at all possible. So. What have we found in July and January? In July, we have about 30 interns that take the Olympics. That's in July. Then every Friday from July to January, we hold a simulation educational thing of the things we just tested on. How to put in a chest tube, how to put in a central line, how to evaluate a patient, how to read a chest x-ray, blood gases. They also, like the interns here, are going to go through rotations. They'll have four different six or seven week rotations to get to January. And we march through. But each of those rotations is different. But the simulation session is always the same as they move through for each of them. And then we test them again in January. Importantly, we tell them in July, the test is coming again. I don't care what you score in July. Let's see how you do in January. And so what happens? 
We have a scoring system. This is what it looks like for 12 of them. These are real scores, real people. 50 is probably a pretty dang good score. 10, not so good. In January, everybody's better. You'd expect it to be better. You knew what the test was coming. You have six months of clinical experience, plus you have all this simulation practice. So they're better. But some people are better by two or three or four times. They really make a transition, really go positive. We've learned to be objective. We need to make sure that everything is objective. We need to make it fair. And we ask our trainees, is this fair? We give them an identical test. They tell us when it's not. Dr. Farley, the graspers weren't as good. That's why my laparoscopic thing wasn't so good. We try to make it identical and then give them rapid feedback. And the feedback that we give is given to them. They know they score 38, and they see the other 30 scores. They don't have names on the others, but they know I'm 38, and the top was 50 or 10, and they go from there. So everybody improves. That's not been a problem for us, and we are not perfect. In January of an intern year, upwards of 5 8% of people don't safely put in a chest tube on our simulation model. They can't not tie as well as we'd like them to, and they can't read a blood gas and interpret a blood gas. But we're better than we were in July, for sure. I ask them for feedback. They tell me it's fair, it's relevant, it's stressful, and they tell me it's, <laughs> it's fun. Um, you know, I hear laughing when they go through it, so there is some of that. Uh, but the idea is it's a professional test, and we want them to give us their A game. Because of the success we had for the interns, it was really beneficial for us, especially when we looked at our preliminary interns. We take 15 folks that don't have a job. It's a one-year position. And historically, for 15 years as the program director and looking at 400 interns, I felt like our prelims needed to be rewarded. So we took one or two of them every year into our own training program, matched them the next year, or if there was an open slot, in they went. And the number one factor to get in was the Surgical Olympics because our feedback from our staff is terrible. <coughs> we are Minnesota nice. Now, I don't know about Louisiana nice or Bayou nice, but basically our evaluations will say, really enjoyed working with Patrick. It was really fun to be with, and we had a great time. I think he'll be good. End of evaluation. That doesn't help him. That doesn't help the program director. We need clear evaluation. And so we decided, what the heck, let's check our second, third, fourth, and fifth year residents. They weren't too excited with this when we started out. And I said, it's not the Olympics. Each station is 15 minutes, and we're only going to use five rooms. We're going to be done with this test in 75 minutes. With 10 trainees in a year, we can be done in 150 minutes. So what, are the, what do we do? Typically, one station is the imaging. We like to assess chest x-ray, CT scan. We give a few mock oral questions, but it's not much time. It's rapid fire, and they know what's coming. We do surgical skills, we do fundamentals of laparoscopic surgery, we do more skills, and then ask some anatomy and some questions. And basically, as I say, we can be done in 75 minutes, and I can give you the data back on each of our trainees. Our program director now gets the data back within 24 hours. And the cool thing about this is we find out with 10 people, nine people are fantastic, one, people, one person not so good, we know we can remediate. That's the person we're going to focus on. The more important thing for me as an educator when we have nine people that do poorly and one does well, I say, the onus is on me. We haven't trained them very well. And we did that. We had a station on melanoma. It was abysmal scores. What the heck? We trained to that, and the scores are markedly better. So this is part of the X game test. For those in the front row, it may be overwhelming. For my chiefs, I'm hopeful they could do this. This is an ultrasound of a breast. And I sit there with a clipboard. There's an objective thing. It says, verbalize what you see on this breast ultrasound. And I'm hopeful that our trainees will say, well, it's an image of a right breast. The probe is oriented transversely. It's at 8 o'clock, so it's in the lower outer position. What else can I tell you? These are centimeter marks on the side. This is the skin up here. There's a spherical object that's heterogeneous, blah, blah, blah. And they give me their best shot. They only have 30 to 60 seconds to give me the answer because the next thing is coming. Name the structures as arrows appear. Aorta, right? Front row's got that one. You got the next one? Maybe not so much. Let's wait and come back in three or four years. But I expect people to know what these things are. I don't expect them to rely on a radiologist. And so one of the best games that we have is a simplistic little game that we cut out pieces of felt, and we ask them, build the anatomy of the neck, of the chest, of the upper abdomen, of the lower abdomen, of the groin. So 
vena cava, aorta, two kidneys, left renal vein, right renal vein. Where do the arteries go? Well, we'll put in the left one. Where's the right renal artery? A lot of people don't know where it is, but it's posterior to the IVC. The adrenal glands, and this is our model. It's video recorded, it's taped, and somebody's checking off. Do they say it, and do they put it in the right spot? So if we were testing our chiefs here, if they could say liver and put it in the right upper quadrant, they get two points. If they give me the renal arteries, there's a left and a right, but they put the right renal artery in the wrong spot, they put it anterior to the vena cava, they get it docked off. And simplistically, we go through this. And it's been interesting over time. When we first started out, people didn't really want to do very well and were sort of nervous. And I'd be lucky to get 30 or 40 points. Now, in six minutes, if you can't get 100 points, you're one of the bottom tier people. We've elevated our game. It's been fantastic for us. Now, when I talk to somebody about whatever, the anatomy of the adrenal glands, that's on here. You get major points if you know what you're talking about. Each X game is specific to its level. Second years get a different test than the fifth years. They're 15 minute stations. We think they're relevant skills and knowledge. We do a lot of fake stuff. Mesenteric um, ligation, um, closing a mastectomy wound. It's a box I purchased from Walmart. We roll up some stuff. We put a lid on it, put the lights down, put the laparoscope in, and ask you to run the small bowel. And then as you're running the small bowel, do you see the little number? Do you see the little star? Do you see the hole in it? Can you do this? It actually looks pretty realistic. And we've, um, we've really uh, gone to this, and our trainees are starting to buy into it. Because what I'm trying to do is create a culture of, I want to be good at this, because this is part of what I'm going to do. If this is useless, then nobody should be doing it. So the second year stations, imaging, anastomosis, FLS, chest tube, groin anatomy. Simple little things, simple little models, a couple pieces of felt rolled together. It's not exactly like the small bowel, but the back row's already been sewn in. We got an outer layer, a seromuscular layer, and on the inside there's some mucosa, sort of a pinkish material. And when they run this closed, will they make sure that they catch the mucosa, or do they not catch the mucosa? Simplistic little things that we can test and train in a matter of seconds or minutes. Putting the needle in the right IJ, we think that's important for our trainees. The PGY-5 stations, we work on pancreatic or jejunostomy, we work on mock orals, we worry about tying something in the chest. One of our ch uh, chief residents uh, two years ago developed a model, let's try this, azagous vein. We tested all of our thoracic surgeons, and they scored a 19 on his test. None of our trainees yet have scored 19, but they're approaching that. And this is what we're talking about. I giggle every time I see it because this is a thoracotomy. You really don't put two hands into a chest wound. Now the guy can't see, and he's trying hard. And the balloon is filled with fluid. And however long it's going to take him, but it's blind because you've got two hands in. You can't see what you're doing. Didn't break it. Didn't pop it. And the ties actually held. So um, it wasn't a zero for a score. It just took many, many minutes. Whereas our chief level residents have to put two ties in there, and they can usually do that in less than 30 or 40 seconds, carefully. And you can see this person's methodical, not super fast, but you get a sense that it's different than somebody else. There's one hand going in as opposed to two hands. FLS is something that we have to do anyway. We might as well train it. And let me show you some scores that we actually have. We have a system, certain <coughs> scoring. If you get a three, we think that's a fail. If it's a seven, you should be on staff and take my job. Five is a pass. So we'd like everybody to be a pass. So station one developed with a FLS. Can you cut out a circle? You guys practice that? It's not the easiest thing to do. It's a fairly hard test. And based on our criteria, not the FLS criteria, FLS gives you five minutes. Mayo Clinic, we say you should be able to do this in less than two minutes. We'd like you to be better and faster. And so looking at this, you'd say, well, chief resident six is a star. and Chief resident two is mediocre at best. And as we play this data out, chief resident six is laparoscopic funding. She's very, very good. There's no question about that. When I work with her in the OR, I'm biased now. I think she's fantastic because she's so good laparoscopically. And that may bias me from a careful evaluation of what she's done in other sections, in other clinical efforts. And training number two maybe isn't so great but clearly better than what she needs to be for passing the FLS. And then it turns out, 
with other scores, she's actually the highest scoring person. This is objective criteria as opposed to me liking her because she's pretty, she's got a nice accent, or he's strong, or he's muscular, or whatever. This is objective criteria, and our residents appreciate this very much. We hold the X Games in the fall and the spring. It is objective. We think it's fair, and it's a high-stakes exam. If you can't pass a station, we ask you to come back and remediate, but not to a passing score, to a good score. So now it's not just a passing test. We've got to be better than that. So we like to pass it on the first go around. This slide reminds me to tell you about electronic and online learning. We had some discussion last night about education. Good discussion. I'm hopeful we'll have some here in a bit. But this sort of changed my world. Fine needle aspiration is done by general surgeons, is done by endocrinologists. Here it's done by pathologists. I tested 11 PGY4 residents three or four years ago with a little model, FNA, and I'll show you a bit, a bit about that. I came up with a test. You have to say it. You have to do it. 24 points. My scores ranged from 4 to 18. My dog could get a 6, but they got a 4, but I got an 18. It was the high. The mean was 11. And I was really bummed out. I was really bummed out because this is, in my mind, how you do an FNA. You feel the node. You fixate it. Maybe prep it a little bit. Slide the needle into that node. Yep. Pull this vacuum back and then get yourself an FNA. It's not that hard to do. So I was distraught about this and said, you know what? I'm going to test this out. So this is what I did. I created a little video. It's less than two minutes. Who has a mass in the neck. It's above the clavicle. Clavicle, sternal notch, chin. It's in his neck. Let's put it just below the platysma here. And what we want to do is what's called an FNA, fine needle aspiration. So what we'll do is sterilize this area, let it dry, get a pair of sterile gloves, ideally, palpate that node. Aha, I feel it. I feel that node. I want to secure it. So I want to use two hands, a thumb or finger. I got to be cognizant. Am I anywhere near the jugular or carotid? This one's well away. This is the clavicle. This is the supraclavicular fossa. What we want to do is sneak that needle into the skin and bump up into the node. Ah, I can feel it bump into it. Now what I'm going to do is insert, ah, I'm in the node, and I'm going to place it on a vacuum. It's important it's on a vacuum. I still got the node stabilized. The video timing was a little bit off, but having said that, it's pretty simple. There was one take. I spit on myself. I said something wrong there one time. But the bottom line is I made the video, and I did a little study. I tested the PGY4s that are bright and talented people. They have experience. That was my score. I sent the video out electronically to every resident in our training program. I brought the PGY3s in and tested them. They scored 18 on average. PGY2 scored 16. And I thought, still not terribly great, because 16 is not safe enough if they're going to put a needle in my daughter's neck. So then I asked them, oh, by the way, did you watch the video? Did you actually look at it? And if the answer was yes, the mean score was 21. And the answer was no, it was 13. And I asked the people, why did you not look at it? Well, I didn't have time. Uh, I didn't think it was important. It really wasn't relevant for me. So you can create education. doesn't mean that everybody's going to learn from it. So this was an eye-opening experience for me that made me think I can teach people somewhat online. They can learn from that. And it's given me a complete 180. My boys are into video games and Madden and Call of Duty and whatnot. This was the best thing I could find. Instead of matting, I'm going to come up with, get all the Mayo Clinic surgery playbooks now, and I'm going to teach you everything about the operations and the pearls, and I want you to learn it before you work with me, because I want to work with better people that learn more. So we have the simulation center every Friday morning for three hours with our interns. We hold 40 sessions. We have Xboxes that I'll talk to you about in my own Farley service, the way I interact with my trainees. I'm trying to get people to learn things before they're even going to need to do it. So on Friday mornings, we use three conference rooms, an operating room, a debriefing room, and a conference room. And we tie knots, and we use, do FLS, and we evaluate mannequins and uh, fake patients. We do some computer trainers. But the truth of the matter is I'd like to get people in there working with the team, working with their hands. This is a pancreatic jejunostomy. It's part hot dog, part felt. It's actually much harder. You were talking about doing a Whipple here the other day. If you can do a Whipple on the Farley hot dog, you can do a Whipple on a real pancreas. If I'm in a caring mood, I'll give you the casing wiener because it'll hold suture better.
If I don't like you, I'll give you the Oscar Mayer because you really have to pa pass that needle carefully. So we joke and have lots of fun for three hours and on a variety of subjects. We just march through the year and we give information and most importantly give people a chance to understand up front, introduction, preemptive video is sent out. These are the objectives. This is what we're going to try to learn. We're going to learn this in the operating room, this in the skills room, and this in the gaming room. And at the end of it, we're going to debrief. What don't you understand? What do you understand? Let's test it. Do you know that? As many times as possible to give you repetition. So if that three hours is on inguinal hernia, you're going to go to the OR and fix an inguinal hernia. In the game room, you're going to play Jeopardy or Who Wants to Be a Millionaire or something else. And then in the skills room, you're going to play with some simple little models to know what a Lichtenstein repair is and how do you sew that mesh in there. Millennial learners are fantastic. They've learned in a certain way. If you give them clear objectives, they will learn them for you. Basically, that's true, right? Organic chemistry, physiology, if they tell you something, I can do that. They like to learn in groups. I'm guessing I'm a baby boomer. I didn't really like to learn in a group. I was competing with Dr. Griffin or Dr. whomever. No, I'm not going to share my knowledge. It wasn't that collegial in my day. Millennials, I've heard a lot of my staff say, they got too much swagger. They're entitled. They think they know everything. That's perfect. I love people that think that way, if that's really true. Because why? Negative feedback is retained longer. So we come to the Sim Center, and we kill people left and right. We make mistakes that are just brutal. And then I get stern and intense and say, that's an F move. That's unacceptable. You just killed somebody there. Do you understand what that means? And I can tell you the retention is much higher. The catecholamine, the stress level is higher. It's retained. Adult learners, we know this now over the last 20 years, learn better with a hands-on thing. They don't learn that well in a group, some guy showing PowerPoint. Unfortunately, that's what I'm stuck with. So what are we talking about fixing a hernia? It's low-stake stuff. There's a cord down there. There's a Penrose drain inside. This is the left groin. And I've got somebody putting some gauze dressing because we don't have a Penrose to put around the Penrose. And now we're going to sew in a piece of mesh. And while they're doing this, somebody's quizzing them. Somebody's asking them questions. How are we going to do this? Who's holding it? Where's your needle driver? Should you put your thumb all the way through the hole? Should you not? You take big bites, you take little bites. There's all these things until you do it. You don't know. Take a big bite of the inguinal ligament. If you take a big enough bite, it's a lethal problem because you hit the iliac vein, femoral vein, femoral artery. Those are real problems for us. And this gives us a real chance to interact. If the thing is on um, hernia for that Friday, we like to go over 25, 30 questions. The best thing is, again, hand stuff. There's a demo section. They're always nervous about that. They don't want to pick that one for their choice. But demonstrate for me the anatomy of the groin. Demonstrate for me pronation, supination in front of their peers. It's stressful, but it's useful. We go into the room and we practice on simple models. We answer questions. And I think the interaction is pretty reasonable. It's fairly cost effective. This model costs less than a penny. This is a mastectomy wound, putting in a drain. Does this person put it in the proper way? There's a couple things she did wrong with this that I would teach and say, no, nah, that's not exactly the best way to do it. But they get a chance on this model and they can put it in 10 times. In an ideal world, a month later and a year later, they do it again. We'll operate on almost anything. Cantaloupe, muskmelon, pomelo is the best. Raising a flap on a pomelo is pretty reasonable. A lot of our interns get stuck on rotations where there's somebody more senior and don't get to do a lot. They like to have the hot stick in place. And can they raise the flap? That's two millimeters thick, or three millimeters, or two centimeters. It's not a perfect world, but it doesn't cost much money. I don't have to spend a lot of money. When we get done with the day, I ask for questions, and young trainees have questions. We emphasize the positives and the negatives. We talk about the negative feedback. What mistakes did we make today? What are the key points? I make them have a little book. I write down, ask them, what did you learn today? Because I'm going to ask you in a month, what did you learn? We're going to go back to the book, the spaced learning thing. We can do a better job as educators. The feedback that I'm getting candid without any names, I want to suggest that this is excellent. Now. If given a choice between going to the Sim Center and going to the OR, what are you guys going to vote for? You're going to go to the OR, right? Everybody's going to go to the OR. And it's a phenomenal place to learn. 
but it's not a phenomenal place for a LERM if you don't have the scaffolding, the platform to understand what's going on. And as bright as you folks are in the front row, there are certain things that's, wow, it's cool to be in here. And when you call your mom later on for that first day that you got involved with a case, and you said, it was amazing. And if she asked you, what did you learn? The usual answer is, oh, I learned a lot. What did you learn? Oh, it's fantastic. What did you learn? And that's what I get in the operating room. Oh, Dr. Farley, it was great. I'll be better next time. It's not always the case. It's just too intense and too much. So to try to buttress that up, we've come up with what we call Xboxes, not the video game thing. But we go to Walmart or Kmart or something and buy some boxes. And we put some stuff in it. We give them some criteria, some objectives. We give them access on a video for showing how to do it properly. And then they, we ask them to practice in the call room and at home. Can they do something? Here's the anastomosis box. You can cut things in. You can put it together. There's enough material in there to do it 10 times, 10 anastomoses. And look online. Are you doing it the right way? Are you holding things the right way? Mayo has a quirky way that we do this inner running layer. Well, we try to teach that if we can before they get started. The cricothyrotomy box, there's not much in it, but you can do it a couple times. And the cool thing about this is two people in the last 18 years had their life saved by a Mayo Clinic general surgery prelim. Somebody that was here, not really interested in general surgery, but having an emergent crike on the floor. Um, we're proud of that. This is helpful for our crew. Putting the chest tube in, the chest tube model costs about 20 cents. You can usually put 10 or 12 chest tubes in there, get a sense. And I'll show you a little bit how we build those in a second. So my ultimate goal is to create a library of cheap stuff that you can check out and practice multiple times before you do it. So if Dr. Griffin has a certain way of fixing a hernia, check out the box, check out the video, check out how he's going to do it. And might he be marveling at you when you show up and he starts to instruct you and you're already doing the right thing and already understanding the key pearls that he has to give you. And so we have 16, 18 now boxes that we can give our folks. Um, they're not used a lot, but especially before X Games, they're used a bunch. People are practicing, trying to get better. And so it's not difficult, but this is our cricothyrotomy model. There's a zip tie in there. There's a little insulation. There's some tape. It's not difficult to do it. Toilet paper, insulation, zip tie, piece of cardboard. I usually don't waste that much. I usually put it to the side. I could have got four out of that instead of one. I'm really cheap. That's the thyroid cartilage. That's the cricoid. Put some skin over the top, and we're ready to test. And now you've got to make an emergent crike in 45 seconds and tell me the 10 steps that you need to put that safely in there. Chest tube is the same way. I built it. You can see my carpentership isn't very good. That thing's been here for 10 years. It's trained uh, four or 500 people now. Put the saran wrap on it so there's actually a pop every time that you put it in like the peritoneum. Depends how fat we are, how much soft tissue we're going to put on. And that's our model, and we've used it for 10 years. And um, we've seen our scores go up. We get a sense that people know what they're doing. Being in the operating room is cool and neat. Here's um, somebody splitting twins, Siamese twins, pulling them apart. There's the 38 people in the room, of which the intern is there, having a great time. Believe me, they were like it. And I asked them, what did you learn? Oh, it was great. You didn't learn anything is the problem. But they got a passion for surgery. They're excited about it. There's nothing wrong with being in the OR. It's just in the sim center with deliberate practice, feedback, and somebody that wants to get better, you can do better. We have our own website that we have a variety of things, that we have games and quizzes and a variety of things that they can look at. I know how to do about 30 operations. I video recorded all of them and put them together and try to make different things that may be of use to a young learner. The young learners, you get, what, 10 hours off between? That's a historic. You guys have had that now. We ought to utilize that. We've lost some of the time that we've had to teach and train people. Some of my best education was down in the cafeteria at 2 in the morning talking with the chief to say, how do you do that and why does Dr. Van Heerden do this? Those things tend to be lost a little bit. We've created an online video where we have a whiteboard. I make some hokey drawings. And then the next step is the same thing. See if I can get you to take the quiz for me here at the end. So pay attention. 
you know where our external ring is, what I would ask you to do is to take a scalpel and make a one centimeter nick in the fascia, not into the muscle, not into the nerve, but through the fascia. A little bit of a condescending this attitude. This is the external yeah. ring. We're going to slide back here, and we're going to put a scalpel, and we want to make a nick right parallel, and we're going to put it right there. Just a one centimeter incision, just barely through the external oblique. So that's what we do, and then my strategy is, then after you've watched the module, you have to take a quiz. I have 25 questions, the computer sends you 10 of them. If you can get 10 right and get 100%, you can scrub in. If you can't, then you can watch, or you can take the quiz again until you get 100% right. And if you pay attention, how long is the initial nick? I'm guessing this esteemed audience can give me the correct answer. It's exactly right, and we move along. And my hope is that they have 25 pimp questions that they know before we start, so I don't have to work on that too much. I've assessed learners now, more than 100 of them, and every last one of them understands that if they don't get 100%, they don't get a scrub. And that seems to be a driving carrot, if you will, to get people to do it. The asterisk is there. Sometimes it takes nine or 10 times to get the correct answer. Uh, they're not sure. And if they struggle with something, I ask them before we scrub, was there a question you didn't understand? Sometimes the questions aren't very good, and I have to redo them. This is all available electronically online to us. You can see Mayo Clinic residents Saturday and Sunday. We don't do too much studying. Otherwise, we use the website. Not unreasonable. We don't use it in the middle of the night, as would be expected. It's mostly an afternoon activity. But it does work. It's useful. It's helpful. I'm hoping to put it online and let the rest of the world have it, hopefully within the year. We've done some stuff on Twitter. One of my favorite uh, staff people at Mayo is Dr. Mike Saar. He just recently retired. But he was one of those guys that would come into my office and say, he doesn't get it. He just doesn't understand. He can't do what I'm doing. And I said, have you taught him? Have you teached him? Have you trained him? Yes. I said, do me one little favor. Let's make a model of how you want something done. And let's see if that won't change things. So we made a model. Dr. Saar is big and tall, gregarious, outspoken. And he decided to say, I don't want to talk. I want a silent film. And so here's some burlap that he's going to sew. This is actually him. And he's trying to show you his technique. His needle driver never touches anything other than the needle. The tissue forceps touches the tissue. And so he's showing you interrupted closure with a vicral suture for whatever reason. And this video is six minutes long. But since he's made this video, the people that are on his service do exactly what he wants because you've set objectives to a millennial learners and they know what they're doing. They can figure it out. It's not that tough. And he realizes in the operating room is a great place to be for people that have the scaffolding and the platform to learn how to do that. What I would really like someday is for LSU Dean to have young trainees like this that go through boot camp that are basically done with their learning. They've got it all. Now all they need is to work with the experts here clinically with patients. They understand all those fundamentals. And I'm not sure it's possible, but we're working that way so that maybe someday, and it's happened for your team, that we're all winners in this. I really appreciate your attention this morning. I'd be delighted to take questions, or better yet, criticisms and ideas for better education. for doing the educational work. See, so you're for uh, uh, growth and development, uh, research and development, standing there with the students in the timeouts, the, the briefings. I see you in the pictures, but you're doing <laughs> surgery. You're a busy guy. Are you really in those pictures in real life? How much time do you spend in the civil seminar personally? How do you get the time? Do you ever sleep? <laughs> really smart people always cut to the chase right off the get-go. I can just bank that that's, that's, that's the crux of the problem here. Yep, I'm, I'm here. When I first started on trauma call and the program director and working and whatnot, it's me in the pictures. And over the last four years, I've been given from the Department of Surgery Fridays to not have to operate and to not see any patients. So I have Fridays available. That's why Friday from 9 to noon, I am there every time I'm here, unless I'm here. Today's Friday, right? Um, I'm not there in the Sim Center today. But otherwise, I'm there. The problem is, 
I'm only in one room. When I first started out doing this, it was me, my secretary, and my nurse. And I basically took all 24 or 30 learners, interns that showed up, and we'd work in one room, go to the OR, come back, go to the OR. But now we've broken it up because the feedback from our trainee says 24 is too big. We're not engaged. We're not involved. And so now there's eight or so in a room. We've worked over time, Dean, hard to get other people to buy into the educational arm. It's not easy because it doesn't generate any RVUs, doesn't generate any money. Having said that, I think it's the most laudable thing that we do. Mayo Clinic has this thing, the needs of the patient come first. That's our mantra. The needs of whatever's best for the patient, that's right. And I buy that to a point. If it's this patient right now today that needs a Whipple operation and Dr. Griffin is the best one to do it, then I'm sorry, the chief resident shouldn't do it. You should do it. If the needs of the patient come first, that's it. But if the needs of the patients in Monroe, and Lafayette, and Pittsburgh, and Memphis need somebody better at some point in time, then we need somebody that's skilled educator like you to teach them through this. And so we'll do our level best. My strategy has been to always be cheap. I don't have a whole lot of money for this, but I hire college students in the summer. They, they get 10 bucks an hour, and they think they're millionaires. I have eight of them this summer. Eight people, three of which are computer gamers. They're majoring in college computer gaming. We have a little institute up in uh, Wisconsin that does that. It's been fantastic. It's cheap. They make 3,000 bucks a piece. I had a benefactor that I can afford 30,000 bucks this summer. And I'm making them make models, all the models that you see. They're making those. I asked them to evaluate some of the data that we collect. I have a few residents that do research time that spend a year or two with me. We also have people that have come from abroad that want to come to the Mayo Clinic or they want to come to Shreveport to get an experience, to get a letter of recommendation from experts that are going to get them a position in a program. And I say, I don't have any funds. I don't want any funds. I just want to work with you. So I have people that are working with me full throttle for no money. So it's on the cheap. But it's been a labor of love for me. I've spent a lot of time, a lot of Saturdays, a lot of Sundays, a lot of night times, but no different than what you've done and everybody else in this room. But I think we're actually gaining some traction that it's not perfect and it's not going to work for Shreveport today. But there's some of the stuff. We've got some computer games these kids have already designed in the first month that I think the folks in the first row here ought to play and get good at and get a top score. And they can know all these facts in less than 60 seconds. I think that's going to benefit who's ever taken on an adrenal gland with them. It's going to be useful. Yes, sir. So I really enjoyed the talk. I have a question for you. In your experience, suppose you're working with a trainee a resident who is struggling with not getting the job done in the OR and the ICU or any pre-op, operative, or post-op care. You follow the protocol. You, uh, first of all, start here. You're doing a good job but these are things you're lacking in. Does that affect your relationship with the resident down the road? Like, uh, after all, you have confronted the resident, in, but in a nice way, you talk about, first say you're doing good in all these things, but these are things you're lacking. Does that affect, and, and when do you kind of feel like this is getting too much? Like the interaction, the, I'm trying to quote the Gottman Institute Interpersonal Skills 5 to 1 ratio. So I wanted to uh, ask your take on this sure. scenario. So the nice thing about this X Games and Surgical Olympics, it's subjective. Because the usual thing that people, my program director in the audience and I share this bond that residents will come in and say, Dr. Farley, I'm the best trainee in our, my class. Look at all my evaluations. Hey, fun to work with. Hey, good guy. Hey, whatever. And they don't get to see the panorama of other feedback. So the greatest thing about these Olympics, the assessment, is people, the learners themselves see, whoa, I'm the top guy in the class on reading a CT scan or chest x-ray, but I'm the bottom with SL, FLS, the laparoscopic knot tying, whatever. So that's number one. They need to understand that because my biggest problem was, and I've heard some discussion here strategizing over time, is Mayo Clinic is a big place and people can hide. And invariably, it wouldn't get till about the fourth year where they had to do trauma, critical care, the ER, busy as stink, and all of us start to say, this person isn't very good. This isn't working out. This is a dangerous person. And what a disaster. This is a million or two million dollar mistake that you've let somebody go for four years. We started the Olympics. We had a little trainer. The first year we did it, we had a young kid, bright, talented, very smart. 
doing the laparoscopic thing. It was a little video game. It wasn't that hard. If you practice, everybody got good at it except for him. He didn't get good at it. And at the end of that time, we're checking for dyslexia, we're checking for um, color vision problems, we're checking for hand-eye coordination, whatnot. He says to me, Dr. Farley, I don't think I should be a surgeon. And having worked with him, I said, you're exactly right. What is it you'd like to do? He says, I think I should be a pathologist. OK, let's get you a pathology residency. And he went for that first year as a categorical general surgery resident and started in July 1, in the second year, into pathology. What a great boon that is, as opposed to finding out in the fourth year. So the other part of Friday, Friday morning, I'm in the Sim Center. Friday afternoon, I'm the remediator. People don't like to come and see me on Friday afternoon. But basically, any staff and the program director is usually one that's channeling all these things because we're Minnesota nice. All evaluation, I don't know how you do it in Louisiana. I'd like to figure out. We don't give feedback right then and there. So if I have a rotation that's done today, the feedback goes out to the trainee. But I don't get any feedback of any other trainees for six months or longer. So nobody really knows who's doing what. And that feedback is crucial to me. So the program director sees it and says, hey, we got some skills problems here with MIS or open things or reading x-rays and whatnot. And so my job on Friday afternoon is I'm the remediator. And so I sit down and budget time. The hard part, as you well know, is can you get the resident off for that time? And that's not always easy. And so what I will typically do is nobody signed up for something. I will send out a note. Hey, between 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock, I'll be in the Sim Center. Today's models that I have are chest tubes, bowel anastomosis, pancreatic ojejunostomy, and I'm going to read CT scans. Anybody want to participate? And the interesting thing is, usually four or five people will show up, hungry dogs. People that staff is out of town, couldn't get an operation, whatever, they have time, they're going to come and get another repetition. And that's really telling for me. It's exciting to watch people get good. We have some people. We're holding somebody back right now in our training program. We're trying to get work this through. I'm not sure it's going to work. The objective data would say this isn't going to work. But the person is desperate. I want to do this for a living. I want to be good at this. All right? So according to Eric, since she's got the drive, that's great. Now the question is, can she give feedback and deliberate practice? I can do that. I can give that. And almost everybody can be a surgeon. Great question. I'm not sure if I answered your question. There are certain things, as, as you've talked about, and you're more expert on the interaction than I am. But I try to be candid and honest with people. I say, look, I'm not here to fire you, but I am going to give you negative feedback if you do it poorly. I'm going to give you positive feedback. I'm going to test you. If you're good at something, then I'm going to switch. Let's move on to something else. Roger? I really enjoyed your talk. And Thank you. It, just, it, it speaks to a lot of things that I've thought about. Um, two questions. You alluded to. And I will say up front, our, our faculty evaluations, you know, being on the, on the RRC committee here, they're pretty, I think, uniformly across the country, we all have the same yep. program. The faculty yep. evaluations are pretty useless. Have you just done away with them now that you have this, at least, at least for the competencies that this covers? Because I'm just wondering, with this objective criteria, what is the point of a faculty evaluation? Yeah. Well, we still think it's worth something, because I look here, Dr. Griffin is going to give an evaluation. I value his opinions. I wish he was tougher or stronger or more granular. And some people are, some people are not. Most of our staff are afraid of giving out bad marks. They're nervous about feedback, kickback, you know, problems. We haven't done away with that because I think it is a requirement that there needs to be some sort of evaluation. The ACGME milestones are out there. I don't like the milestones. I think they're vague. They're not granular. Can you tie 10 knots, one-handed, right-handed, in less than 30 seconds? Either you can or you can't. I'm betting every, these guys can, I'm betting you can't, but if you practice, maybe you can, and you're ahead of the game. So we haven't done away with them, we still use them, but they're still, as you suggest, bogus. They're, they're not very useful. And then the, the second question I have is, you know, part of, I, I share your frustration with the ABSET exam because it's primarily a test that shows how good a test taker yep. you are, and, yep. and we've all had residents who do well on the test, but don't get it when they're actually in clinical situations or vice versa. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, with your Olympics and the X Games, are, are there any concerns? Or have you noticed any areas where there are blind spots, where there are residents who can do very well in these simulation environments, 
but it doesn't, when you get the feedback from the athlete, that doesn't actually reflect the performance. It doesn't transfer, and it's true. It does, some things don't transfer, some things do. And it's very, for each of your trainees, it's not gonna be the same. So again, my first slide was utopia with a big X. This is not utopia, but it's something, and it's subjective, it gives me a start, and my attitude is everybody can do this. It's upbeat, we can do this, and we'll make it work. Um, but it's not perfect, and it doesn't guarantee results. But it gives us a lot more than great rotation, loved working with her. Mark? Yes, sir. Um, more of a logistical question, but the, all of the intern training educational systems for most of Friday morning, uh, how are service obligations covered at y'all's institution? And with overnight coverage, is your intern who's been on night float and stay during the day all day on Friday, or how has that logistically worked out? Well, we behave, we, we adhere to the ACG rules, so if somebody was on call, they don't show up. They're not mandated to be there on Friday mornings. We are expected over the course of 40, 40 sessions for them to be there 35 times, at least sort of 90%, if you will, because that's the way the call schedule should work out. We have PAs, NPs, we have a variety of other folks. And every service but mine has two bodies helping out. So if there's a chief and an intern, or a four and a two, or a fellow and a whatever, there's always somebody else. So if the intern's away, the seniors don't like that. But our program director has said, we need to know that everybody can put in a chest tube. And if today's the day that we're going to find out if the interns can do it, it's worth it. And then next week, if everybody's going to put it safely in the right IJ, we need to know that. And that's been a big step for us, for her to be able to say that. And, uh, so that's how we get around it. We do have NPs and PAs. Um, our ER is not is quite as chaotic as I'm guessing yours is, so it's a little more elective practice that we can get along. It's not to say that there aren't some pagers going off while we're doing Friday morning education, but it's, for the most part, they're there and they're engaged and they're learning. Do you have visitors yet that come to learn uh, your system? In other words, uh, somebody, a tour guide, one of your residents or fellows, take them around and show them your system so that they can take some information home with them. We have visitors all the time, all the time that come up. You're welcome to come up. Anybody's welcome to come up. See the Surgical Olympics, see the X Games, see the Friday session. We've got a couple of people from around the world that are slated here in the next couple of months. I got no hidden agenda here. I'm, I'd be happy to see better trainees overall. My question was something similar to Dr. Griffin's. When I came here several decades ago as a, an intern, then went into the surgery program, we frequently had at that time graduates or near graduates of, of surgical programs of neighboring universities that would come here because we had a large volume of trauma, motor vehicle accidents, as well as a gun and knife club. And they would come here for brief periods of time from a few to several months just to have increased exposure to dealing with the incoming patients and uh, being involved in the surgical treatment and post-op care. Is that available as something <coughs> uh, at the Mayo Clinic? We have historically had visitors, visiting fellows. We've had a relationship with the Mass General. They take a thoracic surgeon and send them here. We send them something else. I will say right now it's hard with ACGME, RRC, visiting trainees and whatnot. Somebody comes in, that means it's a lesser experience for somebody else. Mayo has a robust practice, but I'm not convinced how great it would be unless it was sort of a trade, you know, filling and fixing a spot. But it's, it's happened over time. We've done it. It's usually very educational because somebody brings something with them and they take something back. We have time for one more question, Dr. Samuel. Thank you. Uh, I hear you're involved with the American Board of Surgery. And, uh, they Starting are, tomorrow. Okay. I'm not there yet, but tomorrow is the office. So I'm being proactive, maybe. Yeah. So, uh, you, uh, so you, we know that AppSight is doesn't correlate with the doing exam. And I hear that the oral exam is being made very fair and making objective. Yeah. So that's good. For the written exam, are there measures being taken to make it more clinical, judgment, problem solving oriented rather than P53 yeah. or interleukin 43? No. Sorry, he's. <laughs> so I'm just, just a question, talking out loud that uh, are there measures being taken so that we work for five years, we have all this going on, and we don't 
we have a right system in place. Yeah. So just a question. No, that's a great point. I will be happy to carry that forward. My own bias, and again, take this for what it's worth. I took the absite six years from 88 to 94, took my written, took my oral. I thought the written was a very reasonable test compared to the absite back in the 80s and 90s. And I thought the oral was a pretty reasonable test. It was fair and straightforward. You got somebody with an air fluid level in the chest and they swallowed a chicken bone. What are you going to do? All right, that's a tough problem in an 80 year old guy. So I, I think they've really changed it. When Dr. Griffin took his boards, I'm not sure it was a completely fair fight. And I bet there was some prejudice, and there may still be some prejudice today against women or minorities or whatever. But the stuff that I've seen from the board, the sheets that I get for my testing things having given these boards, are pretty outlined to say, you can't do this, you can't do that, and these are the facts. I think it's a fair test at this point. But I appreciate that thought, and believe me, I don't know anything more about P53 or interleukin-47. I don't, that's not part of my game, and I don't know that it should be part of our exam. Thank you all for the audience participation. Let's hear it for the audience. Dr. Foley, uh, Dr. Foley has given, has performed in this venue, this type of venue worldwide. So this is another plaque for you. And we appreciate your sharing yourself with us here at LSU Health Shreveport. We uh, give you that little memory, and this will pay for your airplane ticket, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you.